do it. Hello, everyone. We are getting excited to have a show. Justin and I both have, are bundled up. It's uh, freezing cold here in California, or as um, many of you on the East Coast would call it, summer. Uh, summer. <laughs> yeah. It's it's very cold here. I. I want to look up what it is. You should guess, Justin. Uh, I would say it's uh, like 40 degrees. Where you are or where I am? Uh, just where I am. 37 okay. to 40. It's 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 like uh, it's cold. It's okay. So in Daly City, it is a whopping 53 degrees. <laughs> oh, it's warm out there. You guys have some marine layer or something kicking in. Yeah. And in Davis... California. It is 45. Oh, that's yeah. It it is we cold. have fog here, but my my house is freezing for some reason. Let's see. A Jenny Four says it's live. Hot Rod says I see people. Uh, I Jenny Four, yes, Kiki is on an airplane right now. So she made a joke in our email saying she would join us via airplane Wi-Fi. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So perhaps any moment, any yeah. moment during the show, right. she might pop in. Right. Uh, especially if we go eight hours. That would give her enough time. Yeah, we're going to go for eight hours. Totally. No. Okay. Are we ready to do a show? Yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, it's 8.02. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 695, recorded on Wednesday, November 14th, 2018. <sighs> Take a breath. Hi, everybody. I'm Blair Bazdurich, and today we're going to fill your head with air pollution, primates of the Caribbean, and venom. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer perspective is everything that said and with some authority i will now state an equally authoritative statement in a voice that will be very similar to the first perspective is not everything it is true that there is a proper perspective for most situations that allows those things being perceived to be more manageable more positive more insightful more inspiring or simply more informative and, of course, the opposite is true as well. But a glass half empty or half full contains the same amount of water regardless of your perspective. A Petri dish left out over a weekend could be perceived as sloppy lab work. Following this uh, perspective could lead to countless meetings on the best way to prevent such things from happening in the future, maybe followed by some dirty looks from some of your fellow folks in lab coats for making them attend such meetings through no fault of their own. Or it could be seen as an experiment all into itself. What happens when you leave a plate of bacteria out overnight in the lab? What were the results of this mistake experiment? Regardless of the uh, uh, perspective, there is always one that can attain something. This, of course, is what happened when Alexander Fleming assumed a positive perspective. What had attacked his bacteria in the dish that was left out overnight? Well, regardless of the perspective that Fleming had that day, the occurrence of soil fungus finding its way into that sample would have been the same. But because of the proper perspective for that situation, hundreds of millions of human lives were saved by the antibacterial properties of penicillin, the soil fungus that found its way into that dish. And while the following program promises to make you smarter, wiser, faster, taller, more tuned in, yet with an air of being comfortably tuned out, all the while secretly developing your inner fish brain 
to have a telekinetic ability to astral project your mind to a quantum dimension of synergistically organic yet digitally disruptive string of nonsense words that we like to call This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening this week in science? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Good science to you, Blair. Good science to you, Justin. We are without Dr. Kiki tonight, but we are going to bring all of the science that is fit to talk about this week, or at least enough for about 90 minutes of it. Today, we have a great show ahead. I have so much science news. I'm going a little bit outside of my comfort zone tonight. Just a, just a toe, just a toe out of there. I have a lot of stories about climate change. Wait, 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 have... wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. That's your wheelhouse. That is my wheelhouse, but it's not animal related climate change. I also have air okay. pollution and its impact on humans, which is different from things that I usually talk about. Um, and I also have uh, a little bit about sperm, very much in the wheelhouse. That's back, back in, in the, the wheelhouse country. again. This yep. is very, this sounds very wheelhouse. You'll see. You'll see. What did you bring, Justin? Uh, what do I have? I have completely wheelhouse stuff. Great. Uh, mysterious monkeys. Something about Neanderthals and epigenetics. I've stayed completely within the comfort Good. zone. Good. I mean, that's why that's what we're known for. It's if you're looking <laughs> for some neuroscience tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Unless Kiki can join Kiki us John. towards the end of the show. Yikes. Anyway, as we jump into the show, as we get into our very comfortable wheelhouses. I want to remind everyone that you can subscribe to Twist on iTunes and Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn. You can find us on YouTube if you want to look at our beautiful faces or Facebook, or you can just search for This Week in Science on any of those items. If you visit twist.org, you can also find us there. And while you're at twist.org, guess what? The 2019 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar has dropped for pre-order. It's going to print within the next day or so. So get your order in if you want to be guaranteed a calendar before the holidays. But all that said, it is now time for some science. And I'm going to start us off, off with some climatia, all about climate change. I have three different, very different, uh, very, very pressing, but uh, distinct stories about climate change. This new one is from the University of East Anglia, and it's about how climate change is affecting deserts. How could they be even more dry? Yeah. How is that even possible? Well, it actually might be swinging in the opposite direction. This story is looking at... Um, at the Atacama Desert. This is the driest and oldest desert on earth in Northern Chile. Um, and there is a hyper arid core in this desert in which no rain has been recorded for 500 years. Wow. Yeah, That's this place dry. is dry. Um, this report, sorry, is not from the University of Anglia. I was looking at the wrong page. It's from the Center for Astrobiology, and um, that's a mixed center of the Spain's Higher Council for Scientific Research and the National Institute of Aerospace Technology. So this is a lot of technological information. They're getting this 500-year record of no rain. This has changed in the last three years Rainfall has been documented in the hyper-arid core of the Atacama. And what do you think that might do to a desert, Justin? Uh, so, so first of all, uh, my, my first reaction is there's a, there, despite the fact that it's a desert and it's super dry, there's all sorts of life forms that are yes. there. And, of course, they're used to whatever humidity is in the air for uh being able to attack. so mm -hmm. i would i would sort of uh, 
think of it as a reverse fish out of water scenario where yeah. there would be a lot of drowning of organisms. Yeah. So a lot of people think that deserts are these barren wastelands devoid of life, but that's not true. Deserts have a huge amount of life, but they are very adapted to this dry lifestyle. And so what we are seeing is a huge change in the local life in this desert. This never before seen rainfall has triggered not a flowering as many people would assume because they're like, oh, this, this super dry soil is now wet. Things can grow. No, no, no. The rains have <laughs> Finally, caused all those seeds that have been just sitting around doing nothing for yeah. 500 years. Well, yeah. Turns out they have caused devastation in microbial species in the region. So they, they found that high rainfall has caused the massive extinction of the most indigenous microbial species. The extinction rate has already reached 85% in the three years of rainfall that they received as a result of osmotic stress that has caused a sudden abundance of water. So these microorganisms were perfectly adapted to thrive under conditions of extreme dryness and had strategies optimized for the extraction of the scarce humidity of their environment. Exactly. You were talking about Justin pulling the humidity from the air and they've been unable to adapt to what to them is sudden flooding and they have died from excess water. They basically drowned. So how, how does climate change just real quick, make the desert wet? Well, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, it accumulates carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and um, it creates a heat-trapping blanket. It makes the whole earth hotter, but it puts stress on the oceans. So the oceans are like the heart of the climate system. They're pumping um, heat. They're pumping moisture. That's what the oceans do. The tides move this stuff around our planet. And so when you overheat the planet, it disrupts these systems and it messes with the flow of heat and moisture all over our planet. And so you see these, these air currents with water moving into spaces that they don't normally go. And so it's kind of caused this jerky motion. It's almost as if a river jumped completely right on land. This airstream is jumping into this space it wasn't in before. And you end up with this dumping of rain in a space that hasn't had rain in 500 years. <laughs> So this is a problem for the microbes. As you can imagine, microbes are pretty important to the rest of the life in the space. And so if the microbes are, are not responding well to this new inundation of rain, that is a problem for the space. Now, what I think is really funny about this article, or interesting, I guess, is that they, they mention this kind of effect and, and talk about it a little bit, but then the bulk of this seems to be examining the Atacama as an, an analogy for Mars because yeah. there's this idea that um, the recurrence of liquid water on Mars that's kind of recent, right, could have contributed to the disappearance of Martian life. This idea that this super dry and arid Mars had life on it and then it got wet and it was kind of blown out. Wow. So if Martian life existed, instead of water coming being an opportunity for things to thrive, it could actually have extinguished microbiomes. Well, yes. Uh, right. So, so when, when uh, primordial algae blooms were producing lots of oxygen, this was basically a toxin to, to what, was, what was here. There was nothing that was... There was nothing that he had evolved to use oxygen uh, previous to this. And it was toxic to, to what life forms uh, could encounter it. So, so yeah, makes sense. So, so there is, you know, of course, the silver lining perspective that, 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 that life which, which that, uh, that can adapt and will will find a new environment for which it can prosper, where before there was too much competition and it wasn't quite as well adapted as its neighbors. Uh, so this is, this is an evolutionary driver as well. We, we must not forget that. The, the silver lining of, of global warming will be that species that perhaps didn't have 
niches in which they could expand and flourish uh, will now finally have their chance. Um, but, I think there's, there's one flaw with that, though, and that is that what you're describing is extremely quick. So there, it's very hard for me to think that that any good number of species will be able to adapt and adjust quickly enough to expand into new open niches in the in the amount of time we're looking at things on. Again, oh, remember, no, no. okay. five hundred years yeah, yeah. this thing was I, dry and now right. wet. I, Not even I'll, like oh, it drizzled there and it's yeah, been yeah. Dry I years. I so understand wet. I understand, but after every mass extinction, mammals included, uh, there are species. Uh, I mean, that, that like the mammal that uh, that take in these niches and take over and expand. Um, but there has to be something left. That's really the problem, I think, is that like you're you're describing it as though the mass extinctions we've we've had in the past were like a a Thanos like snap of the finger, right? And that's not how those more. things work. No, yeah, actually, they some were, of them were. They were not that quick. They were not in the measure of a decade. They were they were short. Well, they the, were fast, but on evolutionary okay. time, not the, like when this. a meteor or asteroid or whatever it was landed in, uh, you know, twenty miles created a twenty mile deep crater in what is now the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it was pretty rapid. But my and my point isn't to say that it's it's all going to be fine. Because some species will some species will persist. Some will take up these things. The problem is we're reducing diversity on a very massive scale and doing everything this quick, and and that creates a planetary bottleneck of micro species of everything that is that has evolved to this point. And and as we've we've talked about many times in this show and has come up, especially when it comes to the microbial world and all that we can learn from it. That diversity, and it does the disclaimer. There's a soil fungus that had an antibacterial property that fought this bacteria. That that was penicillin that we have u utilized. This one little fungus we've utilized to save m tens of hundreds of millions of lives and make the standard of living better for humans for you know 50, 60, 70 years, 80 years now. So so that 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 massive drop in diversity is not beneficial to mankind. I don't. So to put some some numbers on this, the KT mass extinction, which was a quote geologic blink of an eye, right, which was an asteroid impact most likely, took a few dozen millennia to wipe out every dinosaur. Yeah, but, but that's, that's what all I'm saying. Of them. But is, that's to wipe out the, to the very last. I mean, okay. But mammals expanded into that space. So to to parallel to the the also, story that wait, I was just presenting, eighty five percent, eighty five percent of yes. the microbes yeah. in that desert died um, over three years. So so some people, this is not directly to you, Blair. This is to the audience. Some people uh, uh, have a thing that they want to say. And are waiting for you to finish talking so they can say it. Blair is looking up information to counter you with while you are take making your first point. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's my days as an intern. It's what I learned to do. That is pretty impressive. Just it's not just I have this point. I'm going to wait for you to finish to say. It. I'm actually going to develop. I'm going to go and do my research. Yeah, while you're research, making science, I love fact. It. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> okay, so that was my first climate change story. But next, I want to talk about something a little more tangible than those microbes. Yes. I want to talk about sperm. <laughs> so this one is the one from University of East Anglia, and it turns out that your sperm could be Mine? at risk <gasps> from climate change. No. Okay, now we must do something exactly. about climate change. We must stop it from happening because my... Wait, wait what will happen to my sperm? Well, let me tell you. So this is looking at male infertility during heat waves. This is not in humans. This is in red flower beetles, Tribolium castaneum, exploring the effects of simulated heat waves on male reproduction. 
They found that male infertility during heat waves could help to explain why climate change is having an impact on species populations in the numbers that they are, including climate-related extinctions in recent years. It could all come down to zapping the sperm. And the negative impacts for fertility are measured across generations. So we know that heat waves have damage have kind of damaging effects on habitats, um, on ecosystems, on food sources. Local extinctions happen when temperature changes are quick and, and intense. And to look at why this happens, some of the, the arrows here are pointing to sperm. The beetles in this study were in a lab experiment. They were exposed to either standard control conditions or five-day heat wave temperatures, which are five to seven degrees above the normal thermal optimum Celsius. Afterwards, a variety of, experience, uh, of experiments looked at the damage to reproductive success, sperm function, and offspring quality. Uh, offspring quality. So they were looking at um, how well they were able to inseminate and uh, and bear children, how well the sperm function just in general motility, and then how long their offspring survived. They found that heat waves halved the amount of offspring males could produce, and a second heat wave almost sterilized them. Wow. Yeah, females, by contrast, unaffected in their main components, but female reproduction was affected because heat waves damaged the sperm within the females in their reproductive tracts before they could reach the egg and inseminate the eggs. You Following... Know, you know, this was, this, was actually, uh, Go ahead. this was actually a birth control method in the 70s. <laughs> the idea that a, if you were in a Hang hot, out on tub, the hot tub, yeah. <laughs> like, couldn't make it. <laughs> well, and they tell you if you're trying to have kids to stay out of the hot tub if you're a man, right? So oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, if if you're having trouble conceiving, they say stay out of the hot tub, dude. Um, but that's why it's because the the extreme heat can um, repeated stress from the extreme heat can can damage sperm. So anyway. So the females are, are impacted because the sperm inside them can then be killed, essentially. Following the experimental heat waves, males reduce sperm production. So we've already looked at they make less babies as a result. Okay, But now they're making less sperm by three quarters. And any sperm produced struggled to migrate. They had trouble moving into the female tract. They were more likely to die before fertilization. and Heat waves caused impact on male sexual behavior. They mated half as frequently as the controls. When it gets even more interesting, you look at the, the quality of their offspring. The offspring sired by heat wave dads or their sperm live shorter lives by a couple of months, which as far as beetles go, is no small thing. So these, these results are very important for beetles, but they're also important for other animals. We know, as we were just talking about with the hot tubs, that heat shock can damage male reproduction in warm-blooded animals like mammals, humans. Okay? And past work has shown that this can lead to infertility in mammals. So knowing that heat is part of this factor, and then turning that and looking at heat waves, and then looking at these three different pronged impacts on men, their, on males, male beetles, their ability to um, sire babies, their sperm quality, um, and their offspring quality. This is no small thing. This is a pretty big deal. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a song written about this. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's too damn hot. It's too damn hot. Uh, something about like I'd like to smish, smish, smish with my baby tonight, but it's too damn hot. So that's that behavioral side. Heat waves caused impact on male sexual behavior. Yeah. Males mated half as frequently. This is, this is a human too thing too. We have hot. evidence in a song from maybe the 30s or 40s or whatever. Yes, the opposite of baby it's cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. <Yes>. My, ver <laughs> <That one makes> <laughs> my very last opening story 
it's it's a quick one, but it's an important one. This is from University of Waterloo. And this time, so we talked about um, microbes, then we talked about sperm. Now it's time to talk about money. So University of Waterloo looking at impacts on companies that fail to curb carbon output in terms of asset devaluation and stock price depreciation. They say that failure of companies within the emission intensive sector to take carbon reduction actions could negatively impact the general stock market in as little as 10 years. So what they're saying is that experience uh, these companies could experience devaluation in stocks when climate change risk gets priced correctly by the market. So this is all based on the idea that eventually, eventually, <laughs> we are going to be faced with the impact financially of climate change on the stock market. So the, the climate change impacts investment portfolios in two distinct channels so far that they've identified directly and indirectly. Directly, it elevates weather-related risk to properties, infrastructure, crops, which extend to increased market risk in holdings with material business exposures in climate-sensitive regions. So if weather gets more extreme and has a greater impact on, on things that are uh, that are being produced, then those things being produced will have to be insured for more. They will be worth less as a result. Indirectly, it triggers environmental regulations and higher emission costs in an effort in emission control. So this is just the, hey, it's the right thing to do. There's other things happening as a result of this thing. So we talk about um, carbon taxes, um, carbon incentives for people doing well, all of that knowing the this indirect conclusion is that eventually the global market will recognize that companies that are going more carbon neutral are more resilient, are more responsible, and will stay the distance longer. So assuming those two impacts on an item on the stock market and the stock market in general from climate change, looking at 36 publicly traded large emitters and related sector indexes from Europe and North America around the ratification of ma major climate protocols, they found that only nine of the 36 samples were found to display recognizable carbon pricing. So a quarter of them started to price themselves accurately. Um, and that when they looked, they saw that carbon intensive sectors ranked at the bottom of the list across metrics used um, and underperformed the market indexes for both Europe and North America. So they're saying not only is it in the best interest of companies in the financial insurance and pensions, pension industries to price carbon risk correctly, but they have to in order to build an optimal and sustainable portfolio in the long run under climate change risk. So looking at this, they're saying don't care if it's politicized, don't care if you think it's happening or not, don't care if it's gonna affect your short-term profits. In the long term, your company will only survive if you start to address this issue. Which individuals are very compelled by these, these big picture issues, saving ecosystems, um, being responsible, but companies, it's all about the bottom line a lot of the time. And if you can demonstrate through clear um, research that their longevity and their staying power as a business is hinging on adjusting to this threat, perhaps this might start to turn some heads. Fingers crossed. Interesting idea. I, 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 the, the, I'm trying to picture the mechanism that makes that so, and and uh, really, sort of the thing that occurred to me is like, yeah, but I feel like there's going to be less opportunity going forward because I'm maybe insanely optimistic or insane and optimistic. I that the the the, the capacity. To utilize carbons will start to disappear 
And so then you'd have to be, you'd have to be going at some point out of your way not to be using wind and solar or a hydrogen fuel cell. You know, you'd have to go out of your way to to be burning coal at your factory versus using the using the green grid that's available to your community. You know, yeah. Like so, there's, well, that's like, part of it for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, so I mean, I, to, to, to an extent, I don't think it's the company's. I don't think it's a thing that the company, ne uh, if it's not an energy related company, has to worry about. I think if you're an energy company or an energy provider, this is something you might really want to be focused on. But but if you're an industry of any sort that uses a tremendous amount of energy to complete the work, the work energy uh, to to facilitate what you're doing. I don't know that it matters to them in terms of how it's achieved. I think that that decision is going to be made elsewhere. So I, I mean, think not, that's, not that that's even part if of... it matters to them, even if it does matter to them, I think the decision will come from elsewhere. The, the, the putting these things in place will come from somewhere other than the end user. So that's part of this is acknowledging the idea that carbon taxes, carbon incentives are part of our future period. So that's that's part of this is recognizing that if you are in a carbon intensive business, that is is coming. Whether you're doing it now or not, it's going to be part of your reality. But I think there's this other side of I, which I not disagree with. But okay, not everybody is fully experiencing the full the cost of their of their industry yet oh for right. example if i am a meal assembly app that delivers stuff to you to make your your fancy dinner for for one or for two or for four or whatever it is and i can get tomatoes that were locally grown or i can get tomatoes from mexico one of them is cheaper it's possible the tomatoes from mexico are cheaper but they got trucked here so there's it's not directly reflecting right. the but, real so, cost. So, but my my point though would be that long before there's an extra carbon tax on the Mexican tomato, there will be an electric big rig that's transporting it. That was that was the energy that fueled it was green sourced. It was all solar or wind or hydrogen fuel cell. My my point is, I think that before we get to a carbon economy, uh, we will have already transitioned to a green energy economy that doesn't care anymore about the few few rural stuck off the green grid communities that are forced to have no choice but to burn coal or whatever they're doing in those few pinpoints. I mean, I, I think before we get there, and maybe because of maybe you, we could I, we could I can throw out the olive branch and say because of the threat of the carbon tax, which I don't think uh, is really the thing. I think it's just going to be actually economically driven. It's going to be cheaper. It's becoming more efficient. The technology is overcoming the the traditional uh, mining and transport and refining operations. Well, I think part of the reason that infrastructure might get pushed forward is that companies want it, which is part of well, it, right? Yeah, because it's, it's a give going and take. It's like it's, this is yeah. kind of a feedback loop, right? So this is yes. part of companies recognizing that resiliency in the market is about being carbon smart. If it's because it's cheaper, that might be why. That's kind of what this is talking about. Yes. So the, it's we're kind of, we're circling around the same point here. And that is that the, this article, we are, <laughs> this article is saying that it will be the smart business decision of the future to be more carbon neutral, period. That's and basically I'm, what they're saying. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the only choice <laughs> in the future will to be carbon smart. And it will not be up to those who are using the energy at all. They'll just, I mean, that tomato will still come from Mexico and it'll still be cheaper, uh, but it, it, it will be on, they will, it will be coming here 
on a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And, and that's the only difference. And, and to the actual end price of that tomato, it will still be the difference that it is now. <laughs> I, I mean, that's we have assuming, to, we have to move on, but I would, I would argue shift. Mexico could become the superpower at economic uh, height. Of, and then America could be doing all the labor for Mexico. We could be, and then we were like, ah, oh, why did we build a wall? Now we can't get over there and get the good jobs. Like this could all happen too. But <laughs> the point is there's th just, I think there's a, there's a, there's a there's a hump to get over on all of these things mm -hmm. where the, for a split amount of time, for whatever it is, it will cost slightly more to do the greener thing for whoever it is. That's when, all, that's that was yesterday. I don't think for that's some tomorrow. things, not for all things. Yeah, for I big think... rigs, not yet. It's right. coming. But yeah. I'm saying that's still a fiscal decision that somebody somebody has to make. Right. And, and as long as it's cheaper, regardless, I don't think it, it becomes it an ideological. It won't be cheaper right away. It can't be. It, it won't immediately. There's always a hump where you're changing infrastructure where things are more expensive. Well, okay. So, so uh, to that point, you're right. And to that point, I think if you're an established, large, international trucking company, you may not make that jump just yet. Uh, so there is a mechanism of reinvesting. Guess what? That's in the a new carbon fleet. intensive company. Yeah, but I don't think that it, it. I think it's a dollar intensive company, and I think it's the dollar that drives it. And it's not going to have. I mean, you will have companies come out and tell you, "Hey, for the love of carbon reduction." We did this completely transformative thing where we have all electric big rigs bought from Tesla. Okay. We did this for the carbon footprint. That sounds great to the public, but they also realized we don't have to do oil changes. We don't have lubricants. So that's what this article is about. That's the direct. That's that the direct. Has nothing to do with carbons. That has everything to do with dollars. And that's, that's what I'm saying. That's going to that's going to be the thing that does it is the cheaper, faster, okay. better, more efficient. Whether you believe it or not, you're saying the same thing that the article said. I'm okay, not, moving I'm on. on. I'm going to mechanism. Justin, what did you bring? <laughs> oh, it's I get uh, I uh, what do I have? Aha! Oh yeah, this has I I should have uh, been ready for this transition better because now it's going to be awkward. Yo ho yo ho, a monkey's life for me, huh? DNA of an extinct monkey called Xenothrix has been sequenced, revealing that it was most closely related to South America's TT monkeys. Mm -hmm. But this monkey, this, uh, this Xenothrix, is no ordinary TT monkey. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was not found in South America, but it is a rare primate of the Caribbean. That's the yo-ho, yo-ho stuff in the beginning of the story. Uh, thought to have taken to the seas in search of adventure 11 million years ago, or, or maybe washed out to sea during some sort of terrible storm where many such monkeys clung to floating vegetation long enough to land in Jamaica. Uh, then the uh, interesting morphological oddities. Uh, this, unlike any other monkey in the world, Xenothrix was a slow-moving tree dweller. Relatively few teeth. It had leg bones that made it look closer to a rodent's leg bones. Uh, unusual appearance made it difficult for scientists to work out where it came from, what it was related to, how it might have evolved. Plus, it's extinct, so all they have are some bones they found in a cave in Jamaica. So, research published uh, recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, carried out by a team of experts from International Conservation Charity, that's the Zoological Society of London, and London's National History Museum, as well as the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Pretty much everybody got mm -hmm. involved in this one. This is a big group. Uh, they revealed that the monkeys also might have uh, the monkeys might have colonized the Caribbean islands more than once. Study reports an incredible discovery of how the unusual ecology of the island itself influenced the animals' evolution. So, yeah, so from South America to Jamaica about 11 million years ago. And then 
And it's, so there's also, I guess, a couple others. Uh, the oh oh the cap. Uh, what is this thing called? The capuchin. Capuchin. The uh, no, the capromidia. The hutias. This is like a large rodent thing. Oh, hutia. Um, so they're also on the Caribbean islands. They came from South America. So this is it's not like this is the only one that made this this crazy oh, trip. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh so really it is just a oddly evolved TT monkey uh with its unusual morphological mm. features, not a brand new new world monkey. But it's sort of uh, you know. This is this is this is a uh, adapting to a new environment, uh, and and it must have been sudden because first of all, you couldn't have just been uh, you know one. Well, it could be one pregnant monkey that made it, and that was it. Mm. But I kind of picture like a whole bunch of monkeys getting washed out to sea, and just enough of them hitting uh, the island of Jamaica to make a go at it. And then evolution is different because. There's no now. All of a sudden, you you came from the jungles of South America. Now there's no predators. There's no need to move quick. So yeah. You start slowing down. Uh, the diet there, maybe there's a softer food. You don't need all these teeth to gnash at things. And so, even very quickly, uh, they had to adapt. It says uh, the living TT monkeys. Uh, this is because they 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 never they 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 thought it might look like a kinkajou, maybe a night monkey. Hmm. I don't know what a night monkey is. It's, you know a, a it's the opposite of a day monkey. It's a night monkey, opposite of the day monkey. Uh, so the <laughs> but they didn't know what these things looked like. Now they're they're comparing it more to the uh, TT monkeys, uh, which are small tree dwelling monkeys found across tropical South America. They have long, soft, red, brown, gray, or black fur. They are active during the day, very territorial, very vocal. They can live up to about 12 years old. And the fathers often care for their young. Hmm. There are night monkeys here. Oh, there's the night monkey. I've never heard of night monkeys before. They're the hmm. only nocturnal monkey. There's one with a nice suit and tie oh, really? on. I... <laughs> I thought there was a few uh, nocturnal monkeys, but maybe this is there's, always the one that uh, is then being. There's nocturnal primates. There's ah. lots of nocturnal primates. Uh -huh. These are the only nocturnal monkey. Gotcha. Yeah. Tricky, tricky oh, stuff. Yeah. And uh, now in Neander news, mm. 1983, a partial Neanderthal skeleton nicknamed Moshi. Uh, which belonged to a young male Neanderthal individual who died 60,000 years ago, was found at the Kebra site, Mount Carmel, Israel. The skeleton did not have a head because sometime after it was buried, the head mysteriously was removed. <laughs> they don't know why. Uh, however, unlike most Neanderthal finds, all the vertebrae and ribs were well preserved, uh, as were other fragile anatomical regions, such as the pelvis and the hyoid. The hyoid bone, mm -hmm. which is the bone in the back of the neck, yeah, uh, to which some of the tongue muscles are actually attached to. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which I didn't know I had a neck bone that my tongue was attached to. That's yeah. uh, that's news to me. I've never apparently uh, mm -hmm. been able to. Look in the mirror well enough. Uh, so, despite losing his head, Moshi is the Neander skeleton with the most most complete thorax in the fossil record of Neanderthals. New statistical and virtual reconstruction methods were utilized by researchers to uh, glean more information about Moshi's abilities to breathe. So they, they did this, they had the 3D computers and they did models and they put everything together. Uh, they found some interesting differences between the thorax and the anatol in a modern human. Uh, first of all, the spine is located more into the thorax and respective, uh, with respect to the ribs. The thorax is also wider in the lower part. 
and they think this is a sort of an interestingly stable design. But what their research came up with is the idea that Neanderthals breathed utilizing their diaphragm more. Mm. So humans, we use our diaphragm to breathe. You know, you mm. sort of breathe with your belly. We're sort of pulling the air down. Mm -hmm. You pull your stomach out or uh, pull your stomach back in and the air goes out. Uh, it's the diaphragm. But we also expand and contract our, our rib cage. We can sort of do a rib cage in and out, right? Uh, they're saying here that it looks like they most likely uh, utilize the diaphragm more so than this expansion of the rib cage thing, which mm -hmm. is following up on a study that showed that they have larger, much larger lung capacity than humans. I was going to say they're related to alligators, right? Huh? They have a diaphragm. Well, we do too. I mean, we do too. We <laughs> utilize ours too. But I was sort of, sort of uh, thinking about this interestingly, and I don't know enough. Having even though I had ran ran track for like years and years as a youth, I never really. I mean, I paid attention to the sound of my breathing, but I never really thought of how I utilized it. And it, and I know in in martial arts, they they spend a lot of time training diaphragm breathing mm -hmm. for martial artists. And I'm sort of curious now because human, ancient humans with uh, our expanding chests and our sort of but going back and forth between diaphragm and chest breathing, we were fantastic runners. This is the, this is the one thing the modern human was like with long distance runners. We would chase things until they just passed out because they couldn't keep running. Um, you know what else the diaphragm is good for? Hmm. Playing the saxophone. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if they played the saxophone. Oh, so now, can you imagine? Now, are you with me? Bring it back Neanderthal, teach it to play saxophone. Greater lung capacity, <laughs> totally about the diaphragm. Yeah. Greatest saxophone player of all time will mm -hmm. be a future clone Neanderthal. Yeah, also that. opera singers, all about the diaphragm. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. About Neanderthal opera. Oh, can great. you imagine? Neanderthals must have been great singers. Yeah. Uh, so... So it's sort of interesting, like maybe this, maybe this uh, larger lung capacity, but but diaphragm breathing, maybe this is maybe this is a benefit that helps with that sort of upfront, fast, fierce sort of hunting that they did. Mm -hmm. Or or actually, I'm now I'm, I'm actually that was what I came into this with. But actually, now I just love the idea that <laughs> Neanderthals were all singing opera. Yeah. And I mean, that's obviously. why it developed. What we know they were good with the arts. Could there be <laughs> now that's it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Blair. Yeah, or they're just yelling at each other across a field, like really loud. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there weren't as many of them. They had smaller packs, so they couldn't just yell to the the, the Neanderthal next to them to pass it on. They had to yell all the way across the valley. Hey, you guys. Yeah, this is perfect. <laughs> Great. Okay, if you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science with Justin Jackson and Blair Bazdrich. Do you know what time it is, Justin? Is it time for Blair's Animal Corner <gasps> with Blair? It is. What you got, Blair? I have some sad, sad news. Pollution could be killing insects. Oh. Yeah. Which so, insects? Because some I really like and some not so much. Good question. This study from University of Sheffield looked at plants exposed to pollution stay with me <laughs> they found that a particular element of the air pollution nitrous nitrogen dioxide no2 exposing them to similar levels from major urban centers found that they had higher levels of pollution 
um, sorry, higher levels of defensive chemicals in their leaves when present in the pollution. So they, they are better at defending themselves against herbivorous insects. So, so that, so wait, okay, wait, so, so this, this pollution primes the plant to be on the defense for a, for an attack. Yeah. It's like if the plant was like, ah, and then just put out all of the defensive stuff all at once, oh, high levels. Really? Um, okay. And so they found that the insects feeding on these leaves grew poorly, which suggests that high levels of air pollution may have a cascading negative effect on herbivorous insects and maybe other herbivorous creatures as well. We know about nitrogen dioxide as a pollutant that causes health problems in humans, but now they're looking at the impact on something a little bit lower on the food chain. These are insects mostly that are an important part of our ecosystem, unfortunately. Mm. They are um, pollinators. They are animals that ensure the survival of wildflowers, shrubs, and trees. They return plant nutrients to the soil when they die. They are themselves food for birds, reptiles, mammals, and other insects. And so these insects are kind of the base of the invertebrate part of this food web. And they, their loss as the result of this pollution could be a big problem. So without these insects, soil quality could go down. And then guess what? Plants are now in trouble as well. So these declines in insect numbers from air pollution could be alarming, could be a big problem, and it could actually impact availability of human food in the long run. Eek. Eek indeed. Um, moving on to, these are both pretty pretty short and sweet stories for so, the so, first time. Yes, go ahead. All right, so so uh, I got a story in the second half where they did something that sort of turns on a lot of the, it, 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 where, uh, I'll, you'll hear the story in the second half, but it's sort of interesting because again, this is perspective. They, they, uh, they're going to take soy plants in the second half, expose them to a bunch of stressors, and and the plant performs robustly mm -hmm. in the next generation. They do it to the previous generation. I think they did a transplant of a gene from a mm -hmm. different one, but uh, and the plant responds robustly. Um, but if 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 the downstream effect is that it's more robust against its its uh, cohabitants yep. in the insect world. That, that this robust growth may actually so now this is a curious perspective to listen to the uh that that soy story in the second half yeah yeah it's a good question um it's a good reminder that we should always do systems thinking right when mm -hmm. we're thinking about environmental impacts for the first time ever plastic microfibers were discovered in a wild animal's poop from south american fur seals what Yes, these findings were made by a team of Morris Animal Foundation funded researchers at University of Georgia, and they suggest examining scat for pinnipeds can be an efficient way to monitor environmental levels of microfibers and microplastics in our environment. The team examined the scat of 51 female South American fur seals on the remote Guafo Island in southwestern Chile from December 2015 to March 2016. I'll let that sink in real quick. That is three solid months of searching through seal poop. And as somebody who knows these sorts of things, I will tell you right now, seal poop, it is rank. Yeah. It is one of the grosser poops out there that I have discovered. Regardless, they did very important work, these researchers. They sampled inorganic material that was dissolved in a solution in a lab and left only the microscopic plastic particles to be analyzed. Researchers then found 67% of the samples showed a remarkable abundance of microfibers, which until now had only been reported in animals in captivity. So these samples, they're invisible to the naked eye. They're very small, um, but they want to see what's driving distribution and what that means for animals all over the food web. They think that the microfibers arrived through changing ocean currents, so something from just the Pacific um, 
from one of the garbage patches from one of the the gyres or maybe another location just trash out in the ocean so a changing ocean current um cause these microfibers to be consumed by plankton and the plankton is eaten by fish eaten by bigger fish eaten by bigger fish eaten by seals there is enough evidence to determine if they had any aver adverse e effects on the mammals but we've talked on the show about how microfibers microplastics can have morphological changes in fish so good there's a good chance that it might have some sort of impact on them. Um, but as far as we can tell right now, we just know it's showing up in their poop. Yeah. Um, when flying out in the chat room wants to know if poop varies in unpleasantness and yes siree, it does. <laughs> we can talk about it in the after show, perhaps. Yeah. Stay yeah. tuned. Yes, yeah. uh, we, yeah. we can actually, uh, uh, in the, oh, okay, this is gonna be fantastic. In the after show, mm -hmm. We can we can delve into uh, Blair's <laughs> zoology of scat. Yeah, there you go. So uh, yeah, plastic micro microfibers for the first time found in um, seals in the wild. So they're they're getting out there. Okay, what do you think, Justin? Are we ready to take a break? I am, but of course, you've got a lot of reading of stuff to do. So oh, I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Oh, just a few minutes. Hey, everybody. Did you know that the 2019 Twiss Blair's Animal Corner calendar is now available for pre-order? If you go to twiss.org, you can click on that neat little toad right there, and they will take you to a pre-order page. There we go. You can select how many to buy and um, put in your information. We'll ship it out to you. If you order it soon, it is guaranteed by Christmas. Pre-order window is about to close. Soon it'll just be regular old orders. And then when we're out, we're out. But the pre-order allows us to buy exactly how many that you want so that we don't run out. So please go to twist.org. Check out that calendar. Um, I am so excited for all of the art this year. And if you want to see some more of the art pieces, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Instagram, I'm at Blair Baz, Twitter, I'm at Blair's Menagerie, and you can see all of those pictures. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of what the calendar will look like. Also on twist.org, you'll be able to find some merchandise. You can click on the Zazzle store tab and you can see what we have. Let's see what we have here. We click on Zazzle store. And we have, these are our most popular up top. Some people bought our Twist Polo shirt. Twist Polo shirt, which uh, some people said that they needed something a little more formal to wear to work. Um, there was a couple of high school teachers that said that they wanted their Apollo shirt with the Twist logo. So that's there for you. The very popular lumbar pillow. Mouse pads, t-shirts, mugs, so much good stuff. Tote bags. Trucker hats, yikes, um, onesies, all sorts of things. So go over there. That will help us out. Um, and of course, also, Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your, ban your donations help us pay for hosting, bandwidth, contractors. We need to hire fun things we do for the show when we do live shows. 
helps us pay for our flights, all that kind of stuff. Any amount that you can give us is great. $2, $5, $10, maybe $100. You make this show possible and we literally could not do it without you. We accept donations a couple of ways. We have PayPal donation buttons all over our website on each show page at twist.org. Or we also have a Patreon account, patreon.com slash this week in science, which is like a Kickstarter, but it's for media producers. And so you can donate um, a certain amount over a certain amount of time can set a limit. There's a bunch of different things you can do. And we have different kickbacks for the different levels. So we have our, our Patreon supporters that we announce at the end of the show. I now have 13 new pieces of art that I can send to you autographed to you um, in the mail, the original piece. Those are for you at a certain level of Patreon support. So please go check that out. Um, and whatever you like to do, go to the website, listen to our episodes, comment on the show please make a donation. But if you can't afford a donation, that's okay. We can always use your help getting more people listening to and watching twists. You can use your social networks, those beautiful social networks for science. Tell people to tune into twists. Tell five friends to listen to twists. If, uh, if a few of them make it, that's, that's a win. If you listen to us on iTunes, you can help by posting a review of twists. And this is a very important part, giving thumbs up to recent reviews that were helpful to you so that we can get some of those reviews from like 2002. So they're not really at the top of the list anymore. That would be great. Um, wait, we think wait, wait, wait a sec. Wait a what? sec. We, we, we weren't podcasting in 2002, but. I'm pretending but, that we were. It's okay. hyperbole. It's but, fine. But by 2005, we were. Yeah. See, there you go. It was just a little mm -hmm. bit of hyperbole. So no matter what you do, no matter how you help us, um, if you listen on iTunes, if you're using your social networks for science, all that good stuff, we thank you for you for your support. We are here for you. We would not and could not do it without you. Thank you. And we are back with more this week in science. That's right. Do you know what time it is, Justin? Uh, you keep asking me that. I think you need to get a watch. That's I think you need to look is. at the run no. sheet and help. <laughs> it is time for what has science done for me lately? That's right. And today comes, uh, we have a, a What Has Science Done For Me Lately coming from Minion Carly. Hi, Twists. I've written in before, but wanted to share recently not only what science has done for me lately, but what Twists has done for me lately. Yes. Ah. As an ecology student, science does a lot for me every day. It's the core of all my coursework, and therefore I'm constantly immersed in all of its awesomeness. Recently, I was given an assignment to give an oral presentation on any scientific topic of my choice. I was elated, as any nerdy scientist should be, as I ran home to play one of the more recent twist episodes for inspiration. As a wildlife ecologist, Blair's Animal Corner is my favorite part of the show and was especially intrigued by her stories about sea star wasting disease. I was even more intrigued when I heard that the most recent study discussed was conducted by UVM marine biologist Melissa Pespeni because UVM is where I hope to do my graduate work. <sighs> worlds colliding. So I found the perfect topic for my oral presentation. I dove deep into the world of sea star wasting disease and learned all kinds of new and important information that I might never have stumbled upon had it not been for Twiss. So thanks Twiss for inspiring my most recent assignment topic and thanks science for teaching me new things about the world every day. Best wishes and good science, Minion Carly. Wow, that's awesome. Wow. That is great. Thank you, Carly. So remember, everyone, we need you to write in to let us know what science has done for you lately. What does it do for you every day? Now, more than ever, it's really important for us to acknowledge what science does for us and keep it front of mind. So please leave us a message on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash This Week in Science. Or you can email Dr. Kiki at Kirsten at This Week in Science.com. So we want to keep filling this segment of the show forever. 
at least for the rest of 2018. We're in the home stretch on that one, but we really want to keep going. So please help us out. Write us your stories. We can't wait to read them on the air. Okay, Justin, do you know what time it is? <laughs> it's time for more science. Do you have some science? It's always time for some more science. Okay, yeah. So this is this is building off of a story that you kind of left off with at the first mm -hmm. half. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, uh, temporarily silencing the expression of a critical gene. Researchers were allowed to fool a soybean plant into sensing that it was under siege, encountering a, encountering a wide range of stresses. Then they selectively crossbred the plants that were exposed to these stresses with the original stock of soy that was not uh, stressed out and the progeny remembered sort of equ air quotes, remembered the stress induced response to become more vigorous, resilient and productive plants. So this is an epigenetic effect. Uh, they put these, uh, they put plants through a lot of stresses, which we've seen in the past causes next generations to be, a little bit more uh the what's the primed to uh mm. to encounter these sorts of stresses even though they didn't go through them themselves and yeah so the 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 new plants were much more vigorous growers more resilient they were very productive uh, epigenetic reprogramming of soybean plants culmination of a decade long story was accomplished not by introducing any new genes but changing how the existing ones were expressed. Uh, it's just interesting. So this is important because it pretends how crop yields and tolerance for conditions such as drought and extreme heat will be enhanced in the future, according to lead researcher Sally McKenzie, who's a professor in the Department of Biology and Plant Science at Penn State. Researchers identified a gene they called MSH1, uh, which I assume other people call MSH1 because it'd be weird for them to name a gene mm -hmm. just on their own and like be the only ones that called it MSH1. That'd be so I wild. call it Frank. <laughs> right, like, like it would be really awkward if everybody was just naming genes whatever they wanted to and not doing it in some sort of coordinated effort. Uh, but they identified the gene. Uh, that exists in all plants, and when they down-regulate or turned off it, its expression, the plant becomes convinced that it is encountering multiple stresses, even though it's uh, not. Mm -hmm. The plant senses, uh, as it were, that it is dealing with drought, extreme cold, heat, and high levels of light simultaneously. So it thinks all this is happening at once. Uh, it amplifies the expression of a gene networks that are designed to respond to those stresses so what you've basically what they've done is they've got this sensor uh gene that's uh in a, in a pathway that's looking for uh you know once it's triggered in some way it's it's supposed to tell the plant now is when we set these other pathways in motion and because they they shut down the sensor in such a way it thinks that all this stuff is taking place. So this is pretty brilliant. And, and as simple as it sounds, this requires a tremendous amount of research of knowing what these pathways are and how they... So this is why this is a decades-long thing. This is, this is how brilliant genius stuff works. It didn't just happen, boom, but it was tens of years and hundreds of people. Uh, so, yeah... Yeah, no, they, they, to your previous they, point. the original discovery was with the same research group. Um, and they, oh, they discovered that the MSH1 so maybe, gene, so maybe they did name it. I should, I should, uh, maybe I talked too soon. Maybe they actually did get to name <laughs> it because when you discover the, uh, they discovered it a decade ago, uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. This is uh, McKenzie again, uh, studying how the genes. Are that are necessary for energy generation, photosynthesis, and respiration communicate and coordinate. At the time, uh, Mackenzie did not realize how important the gene is for modifying the way a plant, a plant expresses its genes. So this is Cody Voice. Recently, by serendipity, we discovered that after we replaced the MSH1 gene, 
the plant has a memory of that stress. And by memory, I mean its growth features are very different from the plant we started with. And it will remember the stress generation after generation after generation, as long as we don't make any crosses and keep it in that same lineage. Which by itself is difficult when you're talking about plants uh, that not in the wild, but in, you know, even in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, but to a, to a good extent, uh, if there's not other soy planted around this, they should be very successful with it. Part of the research lines derived from crossing with the memory plants were grown in large populations in four different field conditions at four widely separated locations in Nebraska. And they proved to be more vigorous, higher yielding, and better adapted to their environment than a typical soybean plant. Uh, important for the political reality of these times. This is a technology that can be rapidly applied because it is not a genetically modified organism. <laughs> Well, it is, but it's it's it got all these the same genes that they didn't add anything. Right. And this is this is also the ridiculous, most ridiculous and and uh, thing in the world. What what is genetic modification? Right. The labeling for all that. That's a whole. Yeah, other. yeah. So, uh, so, but the brilliantly, this uh, works its way through. So it does not require any special regulatory approval. They can just go and plant it in a field, which is a problem. Uh, for, for those who are trying to improve agriculture by adding genes to things, you can't just go put it out in a field somewhere. There's all sorts of laws that prevent you from doing so. <laughs> so, but yeah, she's there. She's also pointing out that the, this, uh, they, they did this in soy. Uh, but again, this is a gene that is a cross. It's per, uh, conserved, meaning that, you know, evolutionarily, this is a conserved gene across many, 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 many plants. So this doesn't just necessarily apply to soybean. This could also work in other plants uh, as well. So, you know, it's one of the, this is, this is kind of, this is, could be a really big deal, right? Like it's one of the things that I often think about in terms of growing populations, resource management. You, you could put it into the carbon footprint uh, field if you like as well which is that we are going to need to sustain more people on this planet. And you always feel like you're at the very edge. Like we had a couple big things that happened over the years that prevented a mass famine on this planet. One of them oh, was just transportation, being able to move things from where the food was grown to where the people want to eat it in a, in a quick enough manner so that they could, they could get there and they could eat it. Um, that prevented famine. The fact that you could freeze food and transport it anywhere in the world or preserve it at home, refrigeration at home, you know, that, that you could preserve food in place longer so that food lasts longer between when it is grown and when somebody desires to eat it. These were these were these these seemingly simple things uh, prevented famine on a massive scale on this planet. Uh, our population today, with the, our ability to preserve food and transport food from 150 years ago, we would all be dead. We, we didn't have this population. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have gotten this big. And then our farming practices have improved. Uh, higher yields, uh, more efficient use of water, more efficient, you know, the, the tractors now move up and down fields, making those rows via GPS satellite. You know, they're so precise and utilizing every bit of the land uh, as efficiently as possible. So something that can boost the efficiency of the plant itself in providing nourishment to humans, of course, is another thing that we can do to keep this show going, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit longer. So <laughs> But to circle back to the conversation we were having before, I yeah. think the next step in this testing is mm -hmm. to see how pollinating insects and other animals are affected by this. If at all, maybe not. Maybe because it's it's a genetic thing and not really a chemical thing. Yeah, maybe but... it doesn't have an impact, but maybe it does. So yeah, so this is the stressors that they have on this look to be very environmental. Yeah, uh, but not not uh, not necessarily not specific. Well, they're not specifically uh, focusing on a pest, uh, a pest or a, 
uh, what do what do you got? Prey, uh, predator, uh, balance here because they're looking at these other factors. Yeah. But what if the? But if that exists as well, uh, and you have this this plant that can repel pests, as it were, or mm -hmm. predators, mm -hmm. who may be pollinators, who may you know, and it, it mm -hmm. so this could. You're right. This could potentially not be. Or the story but you did before gave for the perspective this could potentially be the end of the agriculture of this <laughs> more robust plant at the same time uh it does it it does at least throw up a flag of of, of research that they need to do in these fields that they have and they can do it because they're out, they get to go out into the big fields in nature and do those counts so that is definitely something that needs to be added to their perspective yeah absolutely and speaking of pests <laughs> um scorpions if there's a scorpion in your boots you're probably not very happy most of the scorpions we think about are very venomous to humans uh there's actually about 2400 species of scorpions only about a handful of them are dangerous to humans, but when we say the word scorpion, we immediately think about that thing, stuck into your boots, you're gonna put your foot in that foot in there, you're gonna have to have your foot amputated. Huh. Well, uh, these these animals, they they're really fascinating for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that they have not very well been categorized. Mostly they've just been kind of compartmentalized and grouped based on similar body plans, but they're all kind of the same. So things are kind of confused. They're not very well sorted. A recent study from University of Wisconsin-Madison from uh, Carlos Santibanez Lopez, uh, he actually was fascinated with scorpions as a child, and now he is a scorpion researcher. He is trying something brand new. He is trying to um, organize the scorpion family tree based on the shape of the venom molecules. By predicting the three-dimensional shape adopted by the venom molecules, he has been able to identify and split to common ancestors of today's scorpion. So he has pretty well organized that family tree already. One branch has narrower venom, kind of shaped like a puzzle piece. The others is rounder, kind of like a marble. This distinct form underlies the venom's function as well. Each shape has its own molecular targets in prey. So this is the very first time that shape of molecules has been used in place of anatomy to organize evolutionary relationships, which I think is... Yeah, that's pretty good. Right. Yeah. It's so smart. It, this could totally shake up the way that we do things. We already look at genomes, right? The researchers also looked at genomic sequences from 55 scorpion species and more than 3,000 genes to look at a preliminary family tree. These molecule shapes followed that and gave more clarity to it past that. So this is really a new tool that evolutionary biologists could use to figure out how animals are related and how they're tree is shaped so they could actually be. identified or it could be or it could turn into morphology all over again it and... certainly could it certainly could but they predicted the shapes of 41 different venoms from across that family tree and they were able yeah. to categorize them down and it really jived well with the genetic analysis so not to say to throw the genetics out the window but to say that this could be a piece of the puzzle there if you know that um two wow rodents are related and they both have a patagium they both have like a like a flying squirrel like skin flap that is um and then there's a third squirrel that doesn't have that and you know that they're all closely related you can guess probably the two flying squirrels are closer related yeah so but already 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 uh they 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 looked over that large uh that large grouping of molecules uh, and, these, and they said they did pretty well, which m either means that there was enough convergent molecular evolution to throw off a perfect, uh, you know, so I mean, this it's, it's not that I'm disagreeing with, but 
but morphology is a rougher look than the genetics. The genetics is is a it's a it's a longer read code. Right. Uh, the, it's you know the problem. A lot more text the the problem involved, with that with makes the it easier to to correlate. The problem with the scorpions is that they're arachnids and they're all scorpions. So their genetics are so amazingly similar. Yeah. That it is extremely hard to parse out those very specific breaks. There are other groups of animals that make it much easier, but the scorpions, the reason it pretty much fit is that there were a lot of them that the genetics, they kind of just had to throw their hands up and go, it could go here or here or here. So based on that, they were able to then look at the shape of the venom and they think assemble this family tree. So this is a situation where you have to use both. Yeah. yeah, and that makes sense. And and you know, but the and it's gonna and you're right, and because also what is the shape of this venom based on? Mm -hmm. Genetics. Genetic, right. So exactly you're you're finding at least a preserved along a lineage uh genetic, uh, which may again may not be may not mean as closely related. They could be divergently related. But this was just preserved in both groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is it is a good clue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, it, it's still morphology. <laughs> Do you <laughs> want to talk about, is it a story about aliens that you brought? Something from space? It came from space and landed in Greenland. <gasps> and nobody knew it was there until <laughs> somewhat recently. That checks out. Um, yeah. You know, is an international team led by researchers from the Center of Geogenetics and the Natural History Museum of Denmark, University of Copenhagen, have discovered a 31 kilometer wide meteorite impact crater buried beneath the ice sheet in northern Greenland. This is the first time that the crater of any size has been found under one of Earth's continental ice sheets. Researchers worked for uh, last three years to verify their discovery that was initially made in 2015. The research is described in a new study just published in the internationally recognized journal Science Advances. The crater measures more than 31 kilometers, which if you're not familiar with kilometers, 31 kilometers is approximately the same as 31,000 meters in diameter, corresponding to an area bigger than Paris. Wow, that's huge. Uh, placing among the 25 largest impact craters on the Earth. The crater formed when a kilometer-wide iron meteorite, that would be a thousand-meter-wide mm -hmm. iron meteorite, smashed in northern Greenland. Uh, but then, of course, because it's all that's just sunk in the ice, just disappeared there. Didn't know it was there. Uh, this is Quotey Voice of Professor Kurt Karform, Center of Geogenetics and National History Museum of Denmark. The crater is exceptionally well-preserved, and that is surprising because glacier ice is an incredibly efficient, erosive agent that would have quickly removed traces of the impact. But that means the crater must be rather young from a really long geological perspective, I'm assuming. So far, it has not been possible to date the crater directly, but its condition strongly suggests that it formed after the Ice Age began to cover Greenland, so it must be younger than 3 million years old, but also could be as recent as 12,000 years old, which is, I think, uh, at a time of a mini Ice Age, uh, which, which would be interesting. Uh, so, yeah, we're, or no, actually, it says here toward the end of the last ice age. So the ice age would have already maybe have started. Oh, but it could be. Yeah, it could have been. Then it, also, that means it could have been at the beginning of it. Uh, so it's a giant circular depression uh, discovered as researchers were looking at a new map of topography beneath the ice sheet. They noticed an enormous but previously undetected circular depression under the Hiawatha Glacier. Mm -hmm the very edge of the ice sheet in northern Greenland. We immediately knew this was something special, but at the same time, it became clear that it would be very difficult to confirm the origin of the depressions, as Professor Kija 
So that was horrible trying to like quickly say it, a name that I couldn't pronounce and then also whisper it at the same time. Uh-huh. Uh, so, yeah, so they're going to uh, figure out a way to to try to to date this thing. Nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Where where is um cratered is the moon it would turn out. Yeah, so a lot of this stuff can hide. Like, you know, the the biggest one uh, that I'm aware of is the in the Gulf of Mexico. It's mm-hmm. you know, ginormous uh, but under the sea and has been and it collapsed uh, at some point mm-hmm. and is still, you know, uh, and in silt and everything else. So these things, these things hide in a, in a very active planet like ours. You'd, you'd be able to see all of our, all, all the warts and scars. If you, know, we had mm-hmm. no atmosphere and we didn't have the tectonics yeah. and we didn't have a darn atmosphere, like, like a moon or something. We just, you know, yeah, but it's, a, it's a, but it's interesting because it could, it, this could, uh, it's big enough that it, this could have impacted uh, an extinction event or a climate shift event or mm-hmm. something of that nature. And the fact that we don't know when it took place, if they can identify when this this thousand meter diameter iron object slammed into the earth, if they can identify when it took place, it may actually answer a bunch of questions that uh, we had somewhere else along the three million year uh, time frame as to what, why, or how something happened. Wow, that's pretty cool. There's still many secrets to be learned on the surface of our own planet. Uh, If we can make it is the thing because the air here in California, particularly not great right now. I have actually the worst I've ever seen it, and I've lived yeah. here my whole life. It's yeah. the absolute worst I've uh, s- thick with smoke, you know, darkened. It, you you feel like it's twilight at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the the fires that are going on and the smoke that's that's settled into the valley is ominous and uh, horrible to breathe. Yeah, it's not great. So air pollution is a pretty big deal. Right now we're dealing with particulates from a fire, but in other places like in Detroit, there's just constant smog. And a a new piece of research uh, published this week in JAMA International, or Internal Medicine, sorry. Ooh, end of the show. University of Michigan's (laughs) um, Frankel Cardiovascular Center looked at Uh, pollutants in the air and the impact on your heart in particular. We think about lungs a lot, but we don't think about our hearts when we think about air pollution. Despite improvements in air quality across the United States during the past few decades, more than 80,000 deaths per year occur in the U.S. due to fine particulate matter um, in air pollution. So researchers have found in this new study that a very small, inexpensive, inexpensive portable air purifier used inside your home is powerful enough to round up a good enough amount of these p- particles to get them out of the indoor air. And it's actually enough of an impact in this small study to help people's hearts. Wow. So this was, um, they tested three day increments, um, and they tested uh, blood pressure um, in in people in senior housing in Detroit. This is low income senior housing. Um, they put these air purifiers in living rooms and bedrooms. Forty seniors participated. It was randomized. It was double blind. It was between the fall of 2014 and the fall of 2016. It's a pretty long study. 95% of the participants were black and all were non-smokers. So it was a very specific sample set. Low income, non-smoking, African-American, senior. So like very specific. So already there's lots of confounding variables here, but it's a good start of a study. Each person experienced three different three-day scenarios sprinkled throughout this time. A sham air filter, as they call it, which is an air filtration system without a filter in it. A low efficiency air purifier system, the cheap one, and a high efficiency air purifier system, very expensive. 
Participants were uh, were allowed to do whatever they wanted. They went through their normal business. They were allowed to open windows. They were allowed to go outside. Blood pressure was measured each day, and participants wore personal air monitors to see personal air pollution exposure. They say that fine particulate matter exposure was reduced by 40% by the small inexpensive air filter and systolic blood pressure was reduced by an average of 3.4 mmhg so normal systolic blood pressure is considered less than 120 um hypertension begins at 130 stage 2 at 140 so the benefits were marked in these um cheaper systems but they were they were even higher in the more expensive ones um but they did not lower blood pressure more in the expensive ones. Pollutants were reduced. Blood pressure was not. Hmm. Um, so the the cheaper air purifiers were, were available for $70 or less. So that's pretty affordable if you're thinking about it in terms of something that could really change somebody's life. So this the next steps for this is to test this approach in a more diverse population to see if the personal reductions in particulate matter leads to fewer heart attacks. So do kind of a longitudinal study and then see um, if there, uh, if other negative outcomes from high blood pressure are also impacted. So um, this is, this is interesting to see kind of air pollution. It's not just about the lungs. It's about your heart. How can just a small change to the, the expectation of what a senior has in their home, if it's a cheap air purifier, will that help improve their quality of life in their old age? Or I would be really interested to know, giving it to kids in their room, will that improve their lives later? Because whenever there's things like what's going on in California right now, they always say, keep the kids and the seniors indoors. Yeah, and me too. I've been coughing a lot. And I, I mean, I'm you can like, hear my I'm, voice. I did a tour today yeah. and uh, my voice is is leaving me. Yeah. Uh, somebody did a comparison. It was like the air quality in California or the Central Valley right now too is, is, is as bad as Beijing. Mm -hmm. And I realized well, we're having a massive fire. Mm-hmm they live in this every day every day <sighs> yeah yeah but now through the uh with the help of dr justin's not a real doctor cheapo air filters cheapo. you can lower your blood pressure just as well as you could if you had the more expensive models sold by my competitors who's your competitor i don't know i never looked okay. it up all right um <laughs> justin did we do it did we do a show I think we did, but we're only an hour and a half in. So we're going to take another break and we'll be back with the second hour and a half. There right was a specific after. text from Kiki, I believe, that said 90 minutes, please. So we're going to stick to it. Plus, we still have a few minutes of stuff to do here at the end of the show. Are oh, you ready? Good. Yes. Okay. So first, I want to remind everybody that our Twist calendars are available for pre-order. That's at twist.org. Again, you can follow me on all of my various social medias. More on that in a moment if you want to see pictures of the calendar pieces. Shout outs to all of our various minions and our helpers out there in the ether that help us make this show possible and all of the special bells and whistles that we have. Shout outs to Fada, Identity4, Gord McLeod, and our other Patreon sponsors. Also shout outs to everyone in the YouTube chat and in our IRC. Thank you for all of the support on Patreon as well. Um, I cannot read the Patreon list since I am not Kiki. She has all of the master controls, but know that I would if I could. And I acknowledge all of you separately right now at once. <laughs> If you're interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash this week in science. Also remember you can help us out just by telling your friends about twists on next week's show. We are having twist giving. We'll be mm -hmm. talking about, um, risk and science fiction movies with Dr. Andrew Maynard from Arizona state university. Ding, 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 ding. This just in. Oh, that'll be fun. Once again, yeah. we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live where you can join and watch in our chat room 
and YouTube. But don't worry if you can't make it. You can find our past episodes recorded on YouTube.com slash This Week in Science or Twist.org. And this, Justin, would like to thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have one of the mobile type devices, you can look for Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple market. Placey. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. We can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist, which is T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, your email will be automatically spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If you have a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes during the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Hey, and if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just not understand it. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, 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 this
week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. And that is it. We did it. Waiting for Justin to come back. I do not know how long I'm going to make it tonight because I have a massive headache from breathing in smoke all day. <sighs> not great. California's on fire, kids. Not good. It's, this is definitely worse than, I guess it was last year's when it happened last time. This is worse, I'm pretty sure. It's, um, you can really, it's, you can see it in San Francisco, it's visible. And, uh, I talked outside for an hour and was coughing and could, like, feel, feel, feel stuff kind of in the back of my throat afterwards. It was really yucky. I should have worn a mask. But, like, oh. No one will be able to hear me if I'm wearing a mask. I'm talking to a big classroom. It'll be fine. It's just an hour. It was not great. I know. It's yucky. So hopefully, hopefully they can get a handle on it all. Oh, we did a show in 97 minutes. I'm pretty proud. Looking Kiki said. Okay, I need some help. What? Uh, I'm having a serious mental block. Yeah? Yeah. About what? Uh, I can't remember a word. Okay. All right. So describe to me, what is a somersault? Acrobatics. Right. It's like. You go and it's hands and the thing. Okay. I'm looking for the other thing that's cartwheel? less acrobatic. Huh? Cartwheel? Oh, no. Cartwheel. So cartwheel, somersault, right? Same thing though, right? Okay. What's the thing where you just are on the ground? You don't go up on your hands and do the thing, but you just tumble forward. Log roll? No. Log roll is sideways. Oh. You're going I think you're, head over. Oh, you're describing a somersault. Is that a somersault? Yeah. So it's not the same. No, cartwheels are on are this. Okay, so it is. A, so I was conflating in my head. Uh -huh. Cartwheel and somersault is the uh -huh. same thing. Uh huh. The somersault is where you just do like a forward tumble, <laughs> and you're not trying to do a head. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, now I feel better. So I didn't forget the word. I just absolutely conflated it, and it was bugging me because I thought there was another word. Mm -hmm. And then I came across tumble, and I'm like, ah, no, that's not the one I'm looking for. So it is. that's a somersault. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ugh, I feel much better now. Do you have any pressing new business? Because I got a heck of a headache nope. from the smoke. <laughs> nope. Okay. Um, I'll address the questions about poop smoking, very briefly. Um. Guinea pig and rabbit poop is the easiest and cleanest and less, least gross because it basically just looks like their food. It's just like pellet food. <laughs> um, the worst is a probably a tie between pinnipeds, so seals and sea lions, um, big cats, like okay. snow leopards, so is tigers. Is it big cat poop? Cat? Because I thought it was big cat pee. Was this so big cat pee is also the worst pee, but it's also some of the worst poop. And then reptile poop. Why do why, why would a predator smell so loudly and foully? You to mark their a, territory. Or maybe they don't care. They're no, like, no, I'm they're predator. I'm gonna have stinky pee. I don't care. <laughs> it's to mark it? it's to mark their territory. It's completely okay. intentional. Yeah. Re reptile poop is terrible because it cooks so long. So reptiles only what? poop. Well, cooks. It only poop. Oh, they only gotcha. poop like okay. once a week. So it's like, been. Why are you cooking so poo at the zoo? I don't know. Time in there. Yeah. I've, I, my opinion, my guess this is totally unscientific, but my yeah. guess is that it's like fermenting in there. So it's extra oh, yeah. pungent when it comes out. Yeah. 
Um, but I don't know why seal and sea lion poop is so gross. It's probably because it's just fish and salt water. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, some of it's going to be the bacterial effects too, the, the microbe Maybe, biome yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 But it's but like, what if, yeah, what if so seals the key, were the key to a gross why, poop? Maybe that's is, why seals went to sea. Is because their they poo was so stinky that like predators could find them easily. So they're like, I got to keep moving. I got to go. I don't care. It's cold. It's wet. I'm going. The key, the key to a me. yucky poop. You can't hide anywhere. The key to a yucky poop is twofold. One is moisture. Moisture is key. So it a dry poop is not a smelly poop. So it's the aerosolization or the, uh, what, yes. what is it? The, like the activation of the smell somehow. I don't know. But well, the yeah, second it's, thing. It's because it's it's uh, evaporating yeah. the scent into I'm the I'm sure that's what it is. It makes it so much grosser. The second thing <laughs> is um, it's definitely related to eating meat. Any sort of meat. Herbivore poop is not as smelly across the board. That makes sense. Except for in reptiles. Reptile poop is still really gross, no matter whether they're herbivore or a carnivore or an omnivore. Thank goodness they're small now. Was it? Does that mean dinosaur poop was probably very stinky? Justin, yeah. tortoise poop is not small. Oh. Alligator poop is not small. Oh. Well, okay. There's some big ones. That's the biggest you got. You know. Yeah. Um, and bird poop also does not smell at all, pretty much. So, so, but this is an interesting conversation because we're, of course, have the perspective of being humans. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're... Yeah, see, we poop into the water, so there's no smell at all. <laughs> no, but I mean, no, I don't mean that. But I mean, <laughs> we, we, we have, we're a long way from tracking prey by the scent of its poo. Uh, well, I mean, some, I, I suppose some people still do this. Uh, for most of us, though, that's a, a bygone era. You know, in the animal kingdom, though, I bet that there is, like, like the, the stinkiness of the, you know, the top predators who are, are, are they're using it for territorial means. Yeah. Um, again, I would think you would still want it to be subtle because you don't want to telegraph that, I'm, that you're you predator. You like, want to I, telegraph. You really do because you don't want somebody else in your space, especially another member mm. of your species. Most of the time, like tigers, solitary, don't want, yeah. don't want other tigers around. But this I feel like, space. okay, but I feel like if I'm, okay, tiger lying awake in the jungle for prey to come by yeah, so I can pounce. I'm like, ah, but I really got to pee, but I know I can't because then the whole jungle will know exactly where I am and I'll have to move spots. So it seems like. I think, I think um, our bodies are flawed in that we are presented with the urge and must act on it immediately, pretty much, right? So, like... Not me. I mean... I mean I've, I've seen this in other humans. Think about a dog, like taking a dog for a walk. Uh -huh. They save that pee up. They only pee where they want to pee. This is, yes. This is true... For other animals, they have a spot where they poop. They have a spot where they want to pee. They do not do that while they are hunting. It's very regimented. Yes. Um, but I mean, to add to that, predators like tigers and polar bears that are solitary, when they have babies, sorry, everybody, the moms eat the baby's poop until the baby is almost full grown. Like for an insane amount of time. And it's because they don't want the smell of baby poop anywhere. Wait, because what animal is this? Tigers, polar bears, most top I've heard deer. I've heard deer do this though. Uh, prey do, do this as well. So prey usually do it um, and get nutrients from it. But they're because, also hiding from. Yes, the but they actually the get nutrients. The predators don't really get nutrients from that poop. It's pretty well digested, but they they're doing it to hide their trace from cannibalistic um, 
others of the species. So like polar bears are famous for the females have to hide the babies from a male anywhere nearby. If a male oh, comes wow. across a mother and babies, they're done. So, um, oh, and, wow. it's, and it's because, um, it's either that the male just wants the territory back to himself. So he'll take care of everybody or he'll just eat the babies so that he can then impregnate the female. Yeah. If the polar bear goes extinct, uh, I think it's its own fault. It's how predatory, uh, solitary animals yeah. roll. It's a uh, rough world out there. It's, I mean, I was just talking to somebody about this a couple days ago. It's a sad reality, but most, most sex in the animal kingdom, non-consensual. Hmm. It's just the way it is out there. Yikes. Anyway, I could I could talk about poop longer, but I feel like um, we're losing people. So um, any other new business? Uh, no. No? No. Um, okay. I, uh, I'm pretty excited. I took next Wednesday off so I can bake pies all day before twists. Uh -huh. pretty excited about that um oh tortoise shoulders what dave shorty what about tortoise shoulders um i saw something about oh i couldn't remember what you asked something about scoots right what's a scoots the what scoots are the individual pieces on um a tortoise shell is oh, that what he's pipes. asking or is he asking about um, is he asking about like, um, shoulder blades? What are the, what is that called? Sc scapula? No. What, um, oh gosh, it's too late. I can't remember things now. Dave <laughs> I Shorty. I remember somersault. This passions. is how, this is what the smoke is doing to us. Yes. The, the scap. Okay. The scapula. So <sighs> that's a good question. Scoot, that's a good question. I don't actually. Mm, <laughs> I think it's a U. I think it's S C U T. Sure choice. Scoot, yes, S C U T E. Yes. Okay. Um, I love when I know things. <laughs> uh, so let's look. So tortoise scapula. Um, it's a good question, Dave. I'm, Ooh, it looks like they are quite anchored, um, which makes sense. So on tortoises, they, they don't have like the free motion that we have in our scapula. They pretty much can do this and this, hmm. and that's it. So it looks like they're really well anchored to the rib cage that's what it would appear yeah i don't feel like so you that's can't the like most high helpful. five a tortoise no def not um yeah so they can do this and they can do that and that's it yeah there we go hopefully that's helpful dave Super scientific. <laughs> okay, um, Blair. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, for stewarding the ship. Oh and yes. Navigating us through another episode. You can call me Skipper. <laughs> okay, Skipper. Uh, minions will be back again this uh, same time next week for the twist giving. Twist giving. Episode. Uh, we hope you will join us. We hope we will be there. Yeah. Uh, those, yeah. Those, I, things, those outcomes would be fantastic. If, we if only all... you could have smell o vision you could smell apple pie and and uh, pumpkin pie wafting yeah, just make from sure you me. Have it, make sure you have it tuned into Blair's channel. Not yes. mine. Yeah. Yeah. What will you smell like, Justin? Uh, as, as usual, I will smell like coffee and black licorice. Great. Okay, cool. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you going to say good night, Justin? Uh, good night, Justin. Say good night, Blair.
Good night, Blair. Good night. Good night, Dr. Kiki, Kiki, Kiki Webb. Good night, Kiki. Who's editing this? Later. We miss you. <laughs>